Okay, the three questions in step one. What do you got? I got, uh, what's my problem, why is it happening, and what's the solution? Okay, so, when you say, what's my problem, nobody understands what you're talking about. Anybody understand what he's talking about? So people say that. So you have to wonder, you understand what you mean, but nobody else understands what they mean. Does that kind of make sense? So, hmm? so that, that would be, so what are the three questions in step one? What would be the three questions? What would be the first question to determine I'm an alcoholic? What happens when you drink? What happens when I drink doesn't determine when I, if I'm yeah, an alcoholic. An if I have an allergy, they explain what an allergy is. So when we go to we agnostics, where we at, <coughs> it talks about here, and then we're going to pick up a bit of speed here. Not, not the kind you're thinking. <laughs> so we're going to break it down now, okay? So, what was the purpose of the first what, three chapters in the doctor's opinion? What's the purpose of those chapters? The lay out the problem and the solution. Yeah. <clears throat> so each chapter tells you what the previous chapter was for. So if you had a book and you're looking at it, do you have a book? What does the first chapter say? First, first uh, paragraph in We Agnostics. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something about alcoholism. What was the purpose of the preceding chapters? <laughs> to learn something about alcoholism. Holy shit, who knew? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> now, what did Bill mean when he wrote that? So, so, who, who? Who's responsible for him? <laughs> oh, I yeah. We'll talk after. Okay, so we hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and non alcoholic. Have they done that? Yes. Very clear. Right now, you should know what type of alcoholic you are. So, what's the distinction between the alcoholic and the non alcoholic? Yeah, allergy. Allergy. That's it. Allergy. I write small, if you can't see it, that's what it is, allergy. So what's the second thing that determines whether you're a real alcoholic or not? <coughs> Who said obsession? Okay, um, where does it say that? It, it doesn't, but we hear that because we like the idea of obsession because we could do something about the obsession. The obsession is in association with what? That I could control and enjoy my drinking. There's got to be a way I could drink with impunity. Have these people done step one who are still obsessing with the idea they can get away with drinking? No. no. So once you do step one, we realize that we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crutch of the problem. And they describe the crutch of the problem as being a malady that centers in his mind. And this is what it looks like, right? Suddenly, a thought crossed my mind. Insidious insanity, blank spot. What was I thinking? I wasn't thinking. As I crossed the threshold to the dining room. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind, it'd be nice to have a couple highballers before dinner and then go find a methamphetamine dealer. Right? If you look at that story, it's pretty well. He leaves the bar, there's only one reason you're leaving the bar back then. Right? They weren't on speed dial, you had to go find them somewhere. Anyways, <laughs> then he found a taxi cab driver that kept him going for a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a good drinker, you know you need something to help you if you're going for a couple days. So anyways, that's another story. So they talk about the malady that we found out on page 23. So they talk about here, ready? First question. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. What symptom is that? Powerlessness. So, so right away, again, we, we hear the, the generic answers. We all say that, but it doesn't say nothing. Powerlessness. It, the, the meaning behind it isn't presented in that statement. So when they say in, on the board, we admit that we're powerless over alcohol, I don't know what they mean by that. So what I mean is I, I, I kind of go with the assessment of what people are talking about in, in the group meeting as what they, and whoever makes the most sense is what I go with. But when it comes to the book, malady. right? The what? Malady. The malady. Yeah. If I cannot quit, the answer is here, right? If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit, what does quit mean for us? About three weeks, right? Yeah. <laughs> Stop, quit. When you quit something, you quit. <coughs> Not starting again. And when you continue to start again, then you find you cannot quit. 
Because you have a mal <laughs> Go sit outside. <laughs> no. <laughs> Malady. Right? There's the only two questions to determine whether you're alcoholic or not. There are no other questions. The phenomenon of craving developing? Isn't that part of it? Yep. And that's what? Allergy. Allergy. Yeah. So here, yeah. here, they branch off different ideas explaining the same thing. It all right. stems from here. Right. What's the first symptom that makes us different than other people is the allergy. They describe this phenomenon of craving. These allergic types all describing the same thing, right? But the base is when you boil it down to its common denominator, it's the allergy. allergy that makes us different than other people. Who says this? Me or the doctor's opinion? Doctor. And that's where they say that's what makes them powerless over alcohol, that when they put it in their system, they can't control the amount they drink. 90% of the time. The second question is, which is the first question here, I don't know if you've noticed that, the is the malady. If I can't stay stopped, now I've got a problem. Remember, they so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse in the drink. Obviously, this is the crutch of the problem. Why does he start again? He really doesn't know why. Once this malady has a real hold, they're baffled a lot. Why are they baffled? Because they keep drinking in spite of their story. In spite of everything they have. Anybody baffled here? Yeah. Right? So, so the first question is the malady. Do I have this thing? Yes or no? Maybe we'll call back in a couple weeks. Go work on your story. We'll be here when you get back. Go drink like a gentleman. Go drink like a gentleman. Yeah, what, what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> that means I allow her to get dressed first? I don't know. <laughs> what does that mean? I drink, go drink like a gentleman. <laughs> by, by all means, you get dressed first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here, if you own snow and you find you cannot quit entirely, or when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take. What symptom is that? Allergy. 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 So, can you have the malady without the allergy? No. No. So, see if I, my wife comes home, I have a long day, I'm going to have a couple glasses of wine. I say to her, I bet you can. She's not obsessed about something, you know. She wants a couple, because it brings about a sense of ease and comfort for her doesn't cause her harm. I do not want pistachios anymore, right? So we see that the only thing that makes me an alcoholic is here. What makes me a real alcoholic beyond the human aid is the malady. So the third question in step one is, ready? If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Wow. What that means is, can I stay sober on my own resources, yes or no? Do I need spiritual help? There's an answer in the book. Can the reader stay sober based on the non-spiritual answer? So they talk about here, when we talked about two alternatives, most of us don't know, I didn't know what that meant, but when they talk about back here on page 25, they're, they're talking about the solution, and it's, it, and it's, it's really, it, it's, the wording is quite interesting. If you're a serious alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle-of-the-road solution. We're in a position where life has become impossible. If we had passed into the region which there was no return through human aid, we had just two alternatives. It's not a choice. It's an alternative. You know the difference between an, a choice and an alternative is? A choice is you walk into a grocery store, I could pick this, this, or this. An alternative means it's predetermined. Remember, I am a result of what step? One, by the time I figure out I have a problem, I'm way over here. It started way over here. I'm a result of step one. Step one's not a result of me, yeah. right? So I can't change this fate because I'm along this line. The only thing that's going to save it, me from this fate, is a different alternative. I need a different route. And then as a result of being on this route, I have a different alternative. I'm not on the same path anymore. What that looks like is, when you drive here, you have two routes to get here, right? You can take the lower or the Coquihalla. My GPS is always punched in for the base when I go through with my bike or whatever. I, I take the lower road. It's a nice road. But if it's led to my demise each and every time, I need to find an alternative route if I'm going to be successful. Yes or no? Yes. But I have no alternative route because that's the only way. I don't know about the Coquihalla, yeah. right? So I go down this path each and every time because it's driving me. I'm being driven by this thing that's already existed way back then. By the time I realize it, it's too late. I'm the guy after I drink going, why am I doing this? I'm not supposed to be doing this. Anybody like that here? Oh, yeah. 
this is the story, this is repeated over and over and over. So I need an alternative route. That means as I'm in hope, somebody says, why don't you punch in your GPS to over here? I'm trying to punch in my GPS and it won't punch in. So they're saying, well, you know what you do? Just take this course of action from 2 to 12. And as you start going along this route, you'll have a different alternative than the route you're on. As a result of this, what that looks like is, so I'm going down, my GPS is saying, turn left, right? The Coquihalla is right, or the other way, whatever. Is it the other way around? Who knows? Okay, the other way around. So left, right. So get the idea. As I start on the Coquihalla, what's my GPS doing? Recalculating, yeah. recalculating, recal, and that's step one. Because it doesn't know we're on a new route yet. I'm still under the affliction of my illness. And I'm still in confliction with me. And they talk about that in the next step. They said we're now at step three. And what do we mean by that and what do we do? They explain the condition that we're in, why we can't trust ourselves or look for our own guidance to fix ourselves because our GPS is broken. But we're saying as a result of these new coordinates in it or reprogramming, you have a new GPS. So as I keep going, somewhere along the line, my GPS will now pick the new route. You ever notice that? It won't calculate. But when I get back down toward that area, it'll start going recalculating, recalculating, right? But if I stay away from that coordinates, what is the likelihood that I'll stay off the lower road? Good. Really good. So my GPS is now recalibrated to keep me on this route. Does that kind of make sense? As long as I do, and that's what they're talking, two alternatives. So as I move through the steps, step three, this is a good one. So they say that here, and we agnostics, they say here, they say I only have two alternatives, which is steps one and two. Step one means I'm gonna to lead to my demise. Step two says this is a solution to this problem, right? But knowing that doesn't change nothing. So when we're in we agnostics, they talk about here, if that be the case, you may be suffering from an experience which only a spiritual experience will conquer. There's nothing else that will save you from you except the spiritual experience. And they're saying kind of like, cheer up. So they talked about here, to one who feels, um, if that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. That means there's nothing else. Unless I experience this, what's my fate? What's the promise in step one? 100%. Maybe or 100%. 100%. 100%. So they're saying here, which will conquer. To one who feels atheist or agnostic, such an experience, what experience are they talking about? It seems impossible. What experience? Spiritual. Spiritual experience or psychic change. Because I don't know what they're talking about. I'm like Bill at this stage. I have my own preconceived ideas of what I think the solution is. They're saying, hey, let us explain it to you more clearly and more in depth. Get an understanding of what we're talking about. Then you could choose your own conception of what we're talking about. Does that kind of make sense? The difference, in order to choose your own conception, you need to understand what we're talking about first to formulate your own ideas and what we're presenting. I've been in the trades for a long time. I still call it a square head and a star head. And people around me go, Phillips, Robinson, hand me the square head. Small, square, or medium, not one, two, and three. I still do that. But I understand what those things are. How I choose my conceptions, that's what I call them, but I know what it is. Is that, and that's like the solution. I know what the solution is. How I perceive it is entirely up to me. Remember in Bill's story, he talks about after Abby explains, he says, the czar of the heavens, creative intelligence. The wording of the labeling of it was secondary. The most important part, did I believe that I could get access to this power that created the change in his life that could create change in my life? What I want to call it is secondary. But I understand that it was the course of action that created this change and enabled him to access this power. Lack of power was his dilemma. So they talked about here. Wow, this is fun. To one who feels atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems almost impossible, but to continue as he is means disaster. Is that a good thing, disaster? <laughs> Especially if he's the alcohol, alcoholic of the hopeless variety. Now they're again describing what symptom of the hopeless variety. The malady. They're adding more, a lot of words to describe this. Malady of the hopeless variety. What determines a person of the hopeless variety? How many people would like to know if you're of the hopeless variety? How many people try to get sober here more than twice on their own and relapsed? How many people who try to get sober in AA and relapsed? Welcome to the club. <laughs> Give you a warm, fuzzy feeling? 
<laughs> Beyond human aid. I know I didn't like this either. Okay, so then they talk about here. So, of the, to be doomed to an alcoholic death, what step is that? One. Step one, right? Or to live upon a spiritual base is not always easy. What step is that? Two. Right? Step two. Two is the solution. Right? So they're explaining this in great detail, the problem and the solution. But it isn't so difficult. Then they talk about here from your code of, of being nicer, walk, working on my triggers, acceptance, surrender. <coughs> All this stuff was sufficient enough to give us an answer to our problem. Then they would have worked a long time ago. We wouldn't have experienced relapse again. We, we find that such codes and philosophies doesn't save us. It doesn't save us. All that fluff and all that working on my behaviors, old ideas, it doesn't save us from ourselves. Unless we experience this change, we're doomed. Anybody here become a nicer person and drink again? No. Hmm? No. <laughs> you just stay at a prick the whole time? <laughs> no. It's, but you know, the whole idea, we do try to become nicer people. How many people? I guess so I'm going to be nicer. To be I'm going to work to be a better person. I'm working on my behaviors. I'm watching out for old behaviors, triggers. I become so focused on me. I'm working on me. What are you doing? I'm working on this. I'm working on that. What's our first obsession? Ah, so I love the idea of working on me. Got anything else I could do in regards to me? Because I love me. Can we talk about me? When I'm done with me, what do you think about me? Never mind. I'll fill in the blanks. We love us. When people talk to us, we're thinking what we're going to say before they even finish talking. We get the but, 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 but. Can I talk about page 62? Where are we? Oh. <laughs> I'll teach you if we're talking out of turn. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> no, just joking. So, <laughs> I'll hear about this on the way home. He's going he's gonna to pull me into the room again. You. <laughs> I love Renee. Probably one of the busiest guys I know in AA next to me. Okay. Lead by example, right? So, they start getting into this thing. If you're agnostic or atheist, now you got a problem because you have your own understanding. They said, they said well, let's, let's explain this thing. So, we, need, we know we need to get the spiritual or psychic change, right? Yeah. We know what we want to achieve because we understand what that means. Where do we get what they mean by the understanding of a psychic change or spiritual experience? In the back of the book, yeah, in the back of the book, they explain the spiritual appendix. So I say, this is what it looks like when I'm going there. This is what it looks like when I arrive there. I should be experiencing this. This is the whole idea. Unless I experience this, I'm doomed to an alcoholic death. I better know what it looks like. I better know the difference between a hand grenade and a baseball. Right? I know. I need to know the difference between a life jacket and a sink. Because my life, need to depend, I need to know the difference between a parachute and a backpack. <laughs> you get comfort leaving the plane with a backpack until it comes time to using it. <laughs> There's only three, life, only three parachutes on the plane and four people. You feel so good about yourself as you jump. The other guy said, don't worry, buddy. He took my backpack. Okay. <laughs> so they talk about here, they say, all these things of us trying to change us, a mere code of, and a better philosophies, such codes and morals didn't save us. Right? So we talk at great lengths. Anybody been to a topic meeting? Let's talk about how we're fixing us with us. Let's talk about these. Let's talk. How do you feel? Well, if you're crazy, how do you think you're going to feel? You're not going to feel quite right, are you? Most of us don't talk about what's really going on. We talk about what we hope was going on. Because if you really talked about what was going on, you'd be like, I thought about killing myself about ten times on the way here. The idea of coming here and looking at you people for one more time almost makes me sick. But I have nowhere else to go. So, hi, good to see you. Can I share? <laughs> I've never been happy. I'm experiencing serenity, peace, and happiness. I'm at home weaving a rope, and I really don't like anybody I, I meet. I've thought about, after I'm done killing you, if I live, I'm going to kill you. And once I'm done with you, I've gone over the bridge three times, and then I pray to God that I don't stop and leave my shoes on the edge. I said, dear God, don't run my car into the railing today. Nobody thinks like that here? Get to the meeting. Hello. <laughs> I'm sober, I'm happy. Yeah. Beep, 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 beep. Three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. What do you think about I don't know, but it's important. <laughs> I, I gotta figure it out. What are you figuring out? I don't know. 
but I need to figure it out just in case it happens. Because I need to be prepared. What are you being prepared for? Well, I'm thinking there might be a nuclear war with Trump involved, and I've got to think, where am I going to keep my sleeping bag and my clothes and my supplies? What? Anybody get consumed here with just not even happening? Okay, having fun. Lack of power. <laughs> That was our dilemma. Why is it our dilemma? And the way they use it in that term, lack of power. So they said, came to believe that a power could restore society, right? They're, just, they're talking about an, an, uh, a frequency, and an energy or something. They haven't defined it as God yet. Have you noticed that? They're saying, let us explain what this solution is. So a lot of different places around the world will explain the, the, the charge or the electricity different. And they have different, but they all do the same thing, right? Some people call it electric, electricity, some people call it power, some people call it hydro, some, but the basis of it is all the same, right? You go to any country and you hold up a light, a light with a plug and you go, they'll go, right? It's a universal language. It kind of speaks for itself, and that's what they're trying to say. We're going to explain it in a way that we all understand, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, made a decision to turn our will and life over to the care of God as we understood him, not you understood him. How many people's minds just went, eee! Yeah. Because we get told that. We don't understand the basis. What it says, you could choose your own conception of what that means, but you can't choose what it means. You need to understand what we're talking about as the solution to this problem. If you don't understand what the solution is, then your own conceptions is going to lead you astray. Right? Because remember, your ideas have you sitting where you are. Is it your solution that you're pursuing or is it our solution that you're pursuing? If you want our, if you want what we have and are willing to get any lengths to get, then you better understand what we're talking about. If you don't understand what we're talking about, then when it came to step one, who explained that to you? Did it say, oh, let us explain to you step one, and then you choose your own conceptions of what that means to you? <laughs> Did it do that? In regards to the solution, the psychic change of spiritual experience and the course of action necessary to bring about this result, did it say you could do it the way you want? When do you choose your own idea of how to do this? Where has it said to come up with your own ideas how to do this yet? <laughs> But we hear that. Okay, we hear. I'll take it from here. <laughs> I got this. I got this. What are you doing? I'm working on this thing. What are you working I don't know, but it seems like everybody's working on it. What are you doing? I'm looking for God. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Everybody else seems busy looking for him. And when I find him, it seems like I'll never drink again, so I'm looking for God. Does anybody? So the true believer shouldn't be getting drunk, should he? Because he already has God. So then why does he have the same problem as the atheist and the agnostic? Why are they all having the same problem? What is their problem? What is all three of them experiencing? Isn't that interesting? You ever stop to think about that? Hmm. Dilemma? <laughs> yeah, lack of powers. They didn't get access to this thing on a personal level to create a change in their psyche. They're all suffering from the same illness, even though their understanding and their religious teachings are different. They use that story in the back. The guy that says, says these spiritual experiences, they talked about over here, if you want to look it up later, with this guy. He talks about on page 27. He says the this, 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 this solution is a, a phenomenon. And the guy says, well, I've been a good church member, and he was almost comforted in the idea that he was a church member. Like myself, I was comforted in the idea that I was a church member. At the different times I try to get sober, I've been I'm involved in the church. I mean, like when it came to this idea, I didn't know what they were talking about. My own understanding was killing me. Yeah. It was killing me as it was killing Bill. Mm. Bill couldn't get past this thing, but he had to see what his friend was talking about and seeing it was obtainable. It's just a matter of willing to do what he did to get what he's got, to get this power. And they say, lack of power is my dilemma. We had to find a power greater than ourselves, which we could live. And it had to be a power greater, obviously. Longest sentence in the book. Obviously. Another obviously. You know, it's like throwing that word around a lot. Hey, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Did you want me to leave now? Obviously. <laughs> okay. But where and how were we to find this power? Most people go, I better go think about that. 
They go to their room, where am I going to find this thing? Stop, read the book. It tells you. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. His main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. It didn't say find God. Find his power. How we, our more religious members define it as a God <coughs> consciousness. But our more religious members and the people who access his power is having the same experience. God don't care what you call him as long as you call him. I don't think, in my opinion, God understands English. He understands willingness. He understands frequency. He understands this thing that happens from inside. Like when you hear a baby cry a certain way, and you, there's a way a baby cries that will get your attention where you'll go investigate, and there's another way where you walk by and realize they're okay. You ever notice that? Yeah. Same like a wounded animal. You hear a certain, there's a certain frequency that taps you in there. You ever talk to somebody and you realize they're in pain? And you feel it in here, you're tapped in, in in a certain way that it's kind of, you really can't put your finger, but there's something at work here. And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about this power. So they're saying, let us explain it to you from our perspective here. Because they talk in the back of the book, the spiritual appendix, they say, all our members, not some of our members, all have tapped into an inner resource of strength. Inner resource? Inner? What the hell are you talking about? I thought God was out there. See, when it came to this, what, what stopped me from pursuing this was I didn't know it was stopping me because of my religious teachings. See, I grew up when the charismatic movement was happening in the Roman Catholic Church back in Montreal. What that looks like is for a guy like me who has never been really wanted by anybody and reinforced by that over and over by my family and friends and all that other stuff. My mom, every time she got drunk, says, nobody wants you and look what I've done to maintain you. Nobody wants you. Your grandparent, nobody wants you, but I kept you because I love you. You grow up with that reinforcement. You already know people don't like you, so you don't even get involved. It's about survival technique. And that's the way I grew up, survival. I moved from one group of people to another as a group, as a pack, and we all looked after each other. We never depended on each other, but we looked after each other. When it came down to push and shove, I'd have to leave you behind for my own survival. That's the way I was raised. I, I, had, I didn't have that human connection that they talked about because at eight and a half years old, my mom, she came, I just got, I finished getting shit kicked by three adults. Cracked ribs, black eye, fat lip, and I came to in my bed and I heard my mom and I ran down the stairs and I grabbed her coat. She had a big fur coat with her wig and she, the other people she was with and those three people, those two heroin addicts. I said, look what they did to me. My mom pushed me back, says, you probably deserved it. I shut off. I remember that moment where I realized I can't depend on nobody but myself. And the next person I ever came close to depending on was when I met my dad. And I started building that relationship. And then again, when it came down to court, I let my guard down and I depended on him and he didn't show up and it cost me three months. That reinforced in me, I cannot trust nobody or nobody or nothing. I'll walk with you, I'll sit with you, I'll have coffee with you, I'll do anything for you, but I can't trust you. I don't know if anybody has that, but I didn't know I had that. So now you're talking about this God thing. Well, now this is a whole different topic. Because when I was 9, 10, I was in a strange gate called the Demons in Toronto and Parkdale. There's three of all the guys. All of us ended up in the same care facilities. But I was in the street gang called the Demons, and what we had was jean jackets, and they were cut off. We had swastikas and peace signs on it. And back then, they'd cost, I didn't know that. Peace signs were determined as a broken cross. And the name of our street gang was called the Demons that we had between the junkyard and the slaughter factory in Lansdowne and Dundas. And that was our turf. And then the, the older kids were over there and I tried to get home. And it was just like nuts. It was just like the way we lived, right? And if I can get home before the older kids got a hold of me, but in a pack, we'd protect each other. We're all the misfits of all the neighborhood. And so I went to visit my family. They were charismatic. They took a vote. They thought I was demonically possessed. I already know they don't like me. I already know they don't want me there, but I need to be there because my mom's there, and I'm on a weekend pass or a week pass from the facility I'm living in. So I go to this place in Timmins, and they take well, and they take me to a charismatic meeting. You know that they're 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 rocking the place, and I'm sitting there with my vest on, my cousin, tough little mother, spit on you. I used to do, the stuff I used to do was just unbelievable. I I was emotionally not well. <laughs> At a young age, right? And I hear this guy talking. I go, oh, my God, the guy sounds like me. He sounds like he's talking to me. So I go up, and there's all these adults standing there, and I'm a kid. I'm eight and a half years old. When I think about it, I'm standing there, 
and I'm watching him go down the line, right? And he's doing the, Benny Hill was the guy, Benny Hinn. Everybody's falling forward, I mean backwards. You ever see that? Yeah. I fell forward. Yeah. I don't remember anything that happened. I came to up the hallway. Wondering what happened, I came to grabbing this guy's leg. I came to, I stood up as a kid. When you think of eight and a half, I was a big kid, probably eight and a half years old, bewildered what just happened. And I asked this guy, I said, the first thing out of my mouth was, Do you have the Ten Commandments? He put me in the back because they didn't know how to deal with me, what was happening. They took me and sat me in a hall somewhere away from everybody. He gave me the Bible and left. Then he came back and says, You better watch it. Because if you don't watch yourself, you're going to be even worse off this time than you were the last time because you'll be even more demonically depressed, the, um, uh, 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 <clears throat> demonically kind of possessed seven more times. They used to say it used to multiply. And I thought, oh, my God, I couldn't afford seven more of these things. <laughs> but I didn't know that, and it created a fear inside of me. And then I went back home, not home, but I went to my aunts and all that stuff, and they said, and they're all looking at me weird. And we burnt my jacket and there was a whole thing that happened and it was a whole religious ceremony and all that stuff. And then they're all looking at me like, uh, and they're silent. They're looking at me. I'm kind of like, what? And my aunt goes, did you go uh, look in the mirror? I said, no. I went and looked in the mirror and it looked like somebody took a pin and stabbed all my pores under my eyes and my neck. It was like all my blood vessels were all broken in my neck and in my eyes. That's a pre pretty profound spiritual experience. And then there's nobody to help me cultivate that, right? And what my, my first experience was with this power was, was I'm going to be worse off anyways. And so they took another vote and figured I didn't do a good enough job the first time. And they re-brought me back to this facility and had a private meeting with me and laying hands on me and all that other stuff. Now I'm thinking, now I know you didn't like me the first time. But when you took a second vote, <laughs> the first vote didn't take, and now, and I have that, now I come in here, and what I'm realizing, I have to have a spiritual experience. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. Because now I know I'm way worse than I used to be. I am, I am on a state, a level beyond comprehension. I have to have this thing. I don't know. I've talked myself out of it before I even started because I'm not understanding what they're talking about. Can you see how that would work? And we all have that kind of idea. So as I started went through this, said lack of power is our dilemma. And they started to explain that thing. And as they went through here, they started talking to the believer, the true believer, and, and the, the agnostic. And they talked about, you know, do I understand this power that happens from within? And so when you kind of go to, when you break it down, to say the basis of this thing is being willing to be, be willing that there is a power greater than ourselves. Nothing more is required to make our beginning to build this wonderful uh, spiritual structure. And it happens from within. So I know I needed to get this power to have this experience, but where and how where was I to start this experience? I know where I need to go. I know what I need to get there, but where am I starting from? Nobody ever explained that to me. So nobody ever explained that step two, where this thing starts from, because we know what it looks like when I get there, when I start, when I end up in Cuba as a result of these results or, or, or talking to these travel agents. I know where I'm going. I know how to get there, but where am I starting from? It's very important that every time a GPS works correctly, it needs to know one thing. Where your starting point is. You can punch in where you're going. It can give you, but unless you know where you're starting from, you have no route to get there. Most of us don't have no route to get there. We're trying to get to a location that we don't know where we're starting from because this is not explained correctly. Well, for me anyway. So if you go to page 54 and 55, they talk about stuff in here that's really mind-blowing, right? They talk about it at the simplest form, right? So what they're saying is they get into this, and a lot of people take this, and they kind of go on 53. They say, God either is or isn't. What's our decision to be? But they don't finish reading the conversation. They're saying, arrived at this point, we're going to have a problem. They said, well, relax. Let us explain it to you again. It's not a black and white decision. Well, some of us take that idea and say, well, you need to make a decision. God either is or isn't. Well, wait a minute. That's not what it's saying. It says, arrived at this point, we may have a problem. Let's explain it a little better in a way that might be more comprehensible, like more understandable. So they go through this thing, and then on the next page, on 54, they talk about 
this entity that has been driving us. We have been being governed by our power, our own power, our own understanding, our own belief system, and it's not been working. Lack of power is our dilemma. And they talk about, are we not a sum result of everything we thought about or felt about? Did not these feelings drive us or determine the existence of our, right, determine our existence? Did not my belief system have me right where I am? Everything I believe took action on and, and been driven by, am I not a sum result of all my belief systems? And my own power and govern, like my own power. Am I not? So when I see, hey, I've been governed by something all along. And it's been leading to my demise. And so they start saying, here, let's look at this differently. Like a feeling for a friend. They said this power originates from within. But let's get you an idea of what it looks like. Because you've always had it. But you may have been unaware of it. And we're going to explain it in a way where it's ta- palatable and tangible for you. They say, so when they talk about here... In 55, they talk about actually we're fooling ourselves for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. May be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or another it was there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and a miraculous demonstration of that power in your human lives is fact as old as man himself. So when my sponsor took me through this, he brought me back to page 54 and he said these governing feelings and ideas aren't you a sum result of all those things? And I said, yeah. He says, this God thing has always been with you. I said, well, how? He says, remember that time when, when you were ODing and you called out to God and, and something shift? Remember that time when you were lying there and, and it's kind of like something told you to roll over, don't fall asleep on your back? Remember that time where you're kind of, you're at your darkest hour and you cried out to God and somebody showed up? Remember that time? So he asked me to go back over my life and mark down these times that explanations are far beyond anything I could tie to it. The time I was nearly killed when I was a kid, but something was governing me. The time I had that experience with that religious thing, and something was governing. Those feelings inside that wanted better for me than I was experiencing. Every time those 11 years, I'd have those moments of something inside saying there's something different. The time I was driving... It, it, it was kind of funny, and I said, God works in strange ways. I'm on bail, and I'm on, I'm on observation, and, and uh, it was kind of like I was looking at some pretty heavy stuff. And I'm coming off the Gardner Expressway, and, and, I, and I had a 26er between my legs. I'm smoking a coker, and I have something in the trunk. I have something under the thing. I have methamphetamine. I have mushrooms. I'm a walking pharmaceutical store. Like, when I go, I go, I have fun. Like I go, like I don't know where I end up. I don't know where I come to. I end up in situations like, like not even I know I was there. I wake up in a lot of situations of people explaining me stuff, and I'm going, "Hey, I just got here myself, man." <laughs> like, you know. So I, I don't know where I was. I was kind of, I guess I was on a couple day run. <clears throat> I'm coming off the Gardner Expressway. I'm, po- I'm smoking this coker, and I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of just trying to get my head straight so I could see because the lines are going blur, and there's a road check. I put the joint in the ashtray and I said, God, if you get me out of this, fast. Get me out of there, I'll cut my hair, I'll go back to the Baptist church, I'll go to a choir. I mean, that's it. I will stop everything. Any negotiators here? I sat up in that seat and I know what I'm doing. I'm on bail. I mean, there's enough stuff there that, like, I'm hooked. I, I've been on a three-day drunk. Like, I'm, I'm done. And what was in the car, like, I'm done. I'm already looking at penitentiary time. What was in there was enough to have me done. And what the funny part was, if you went to the back of my car, it would be easy, does it, live and let live, but for the grace of God. <laughs> On the back of my car, right? The guy waves me through. Oh, wow. I picked up the joint and said, God, that was close. <laughs> That's my idea of spirituality. But I realized something was working beyond my life, these inches and moments of, of things that could went seriously wrong. And I realized there was always something governing me, right? And then they tell me this thing is within me and it's always been there. And that's the starting point is deep down within Right, And it's blocked by all these things. And I don't know what these things are because I've only been able to tap into this thing every once in a while. That thing that gave me comfort in the darkness. Those things at my lowest point in time where I was able, it kind of was, a, was a, a flashlight in the darkness. When I talked about all those times of my, I used to be able to shut off and go to this place and I realized this place was always there to try well, want it better for me than I was experiencing. You know, I was just saying last night 
I was thinking beatings I used to incur from my stepfather. He was just out of the Second World War. He was a, a, a Nazi German soldier. He worked under the SS. When he used to get drunk, he used to talk about the killings in, in, in the barns of shooting women and children and all that shit. And he would sit there. And I was terrified of this man. He was an atheist. And when I was a kid, he sat me on, I remember, I still remember that moment because it was traumatizing. He sat me out on the porch in Toronto. It was an electrical storm. I was probably four or six years old. I was wearing, I remember this, everything. I was sitting there and I was looking at this man for guidance. And the electrical storm was lightning and it was hot. And it was like, the, 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 it was like I was scared terrified and he said to me he says you know what that is he says god's mad at you oh. he said that's why that's happening and i just barely never thought but then i remember what i did after that. i went under my bed and i was begging god not to be mad at me anymore oh. right that was my idea of god my idea was god to have to have another exorcism my idea of god was i was beyond reproach i was beyond help i was beyond anything that you guys had to offer now you're saying this stuff's available to me not to me you don't know me. You don't know where I come from. You don't know my life. You don't know my parents. You don't know what I've done. I'm beyond anything you guys got to approach. What works for you won't work for me because I always got, I got confirmation that I'm demonically possessed. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Nobody wants anything to do with me. What are you going to do for me? You're lying, motherfuckers. Excuse me. <laughs> but that's in my head. And I'm sitting there smiling, eh? I know you're lying. Because everybody's ever lied to me. And nobody's been ever honest to me. And never, now you're telling me you're going to help me? Right, So when I got to this place, the guys who I looked at, for the first time I felt comfortable enough that I could depend on what they were saying through their example. I knew that their lives depend on carrying this message to me and that they were there to help me without me realizing it. And I started on this thing that realized this thing has always been with me. And I said, okay, God. I said, I don't know who you are or what you are, but I'm ready, man. You show me. You show me this thing that they say everything's available here. You said you were willing to look after me and help me with this thing. Hook me up. That's the way I talked to God, or the power back then. I said, come on, bring it on. Let's see what you got. I don't know if you, normal people talk to God that way, but I was talking to God that way. What I had to lose. Everything was already gone. I'm picking green by them, cutting my own hair. They want me to go for assessment, uh, psych assessment. I'm unemployable. Nobody wants anything to do with me. i got federal and provincial charges. My life's over. I'm not going to live that much longer. I already buried my brother. Buried my brother at 32. Like I, was, I wasn't at that time, but I mean, like, I, my life was over. So what did I have? I said, okay, show me. Let, let's rock this thing, right? So I, I started from that point that this thing was within me. And when I look back, I realized there was always something governing me inside. Each and every one of us has this beacon, this life force, this thing inside of us that wants us to move on. Like, we're a weird bunch of people. You ever hear people, I didn't have the balls to kill myself. You're not supposed to. <laughs> we're the only group of people. Sorry to hear that. Oh, jeez. <laughs> like, 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 what? <laughs> My wife heard us talking like that once. She goes, what do you mean? She says, you're not supposed to have that to kill yourself. Like the body, like our whole purpose is to live. Like, like it will shut organs down so we live. There's everything, there's nothing natural about killing yourself. There's nothing. And we think, oh, I didn't have the jam to do it. You're not supposed to. <laughs> you ever have that? When I stood on that balcony at 15 and I was going to jump something inside, approached me without me realizing that it created a shift in my thinking where I didn't do it. And it was in the form of a resentment may sound kind of weird, but it approached me in such a way where I stepped back from that balcony because I didn't want to prove all those people wrong. I mean, right. So I had a starting point, and I realized this thing has always been there. I said, okay, I'm ready to start. I'm ready to start this thing. So now when we come back, we're going to look at three, four, and five, right? And then uh, we'll get dinner, and then after dinner, we're going to do six and seven, eight and nine, and tomorrow we're going to do ten and eleven. But you think if you had problems with some of the things we've been talking about, wait till you see when I talk about the fourth now and six and seven. It's so do a lot of meditation, have a couple <laughs> cigarettes, <laughs> read that prayer, have an open mind, because I'm going to talk in a way that probably a lot of you haven't heard of, and you'll be able to argue about it for weeks after I'm gone. And then about 10 years from now, you go, oh, I see what he's talking about now. But anyways, let's break